Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another of the webinars organized by History Reclaimed. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you uh, an old friend and colleague, uh, Professor Simon Heffer. Uh, Simon is, I'm sure, known to many of you as a leading journalist and columnist. Uh, he's worked across Fleet Street in his career, but most notably for The Telegraph and The Spectator. Uh, he's also uh, a professor at the University of Buckingham, uh, where he teaches a range of courses, particularly in Victorian history. Uh, in recent years, he's been the author of some very notable books on modern British history. Uh, I count among them The Age of Decadence, Britain, 1880 to 1914, which was published in 2018. Uh, and my personal favourite, High Minds, The Victorians and the Birth of Modern Britain of 2014. Uh, and most recently, just a few weeks ago, he published a very well-received study of the 1920s and 30s, Sing As We Go, Britain Between the Wars. And that will form the basis of today's seminar, uh, the initial working title of which was British Foreign Policy Between the World Wars, but which has been refined recently uh, and is now Neville Chamberlain in Rehab. So I'm going to hand you over to Simon, uh, who will explain more. Simon. Lawrence, thank you. And thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting me uh, to give this talk to this very distinguished group of people. I'm, I'm enormously grateful to you. Um, I wrote this book. It's the fourth and final volume uh, of my history of Britain from uh, 1838 to 1939 uh, with an open mind about Neville Chamberlain. Uh, I'm in that generation, of course, who've been brought up to believe that Winston Churchill saved our country, which I think is a great deal of truth in that, uh, and that uh, he was uh, a formidably great man. I think there's a lot of truth in that as well. But it seems that much of Churchill's greatness uh, has come at the expense of the reputation of Chamberlain. And uh, I remember reading The Gathering Storm when I was in my late teens, and thinking, my God, you know, what a shambles and joke the Chamberlain administration was. It was in studying uh, and researching for um, Sing As We Go that I changed my mind. Uh, I uh, learned so much about Chamberlain before he became uh, Prime Minister in 1937. His role, particularly as a health minister in the 1920s, uh, and his role as Chancellor of the Exchequer during uh, the the worst years, really, of the slump uh, from 1931 to 1937. And I realised he was a formidable man. But more to the point, when I got into the uh, s sifting the papers uh, of what went on in 1938 and 1939, it also became clear to me that although he made mistakes, and I shan't be pretending he didn't, uh, he his room for manoeuvre, in the face of the threat uh, of the of the wickedness of Nazism and of Germany and of the fascist axis that was being formed between him and Mussolini, his room for manoeuvre was very, very limited. And uh, I came to the conclusion in the book, and I'll try and justify it today, that uh, Chamberlain really did his best for Britain. And I'm not entirely sure anybody else who might have been in power at that time would have done better. Uh, Chamberlain first served his country nationally in the Great War when he became Director of National Service and his experience of Lloyd George, whom he detested, uh, was such that he refused an invitation to serve in the Lloyd George Coalition after he was elected to Parliament in 1918. He, des he described Lloyd George as so sly, so treacherous and unscrupulous and a man who never had the rudiments of a gentleman. Um, he later called him this dirty little Welsh attorney. They really, there was no love lost there at all. Uh, he was offered the job of, of uh, a minister at the um, uh, Ministry of Health uh, under Christopher Addison, and he turned that down. But he did agree to uh, sit on a, com a parliamentary committee, the Unhealthy Areas Committee, uh, and became an expert on slum housing. And when Lloyd George uh, left the stage in 1922, uh, Chamberlain was more than willing to serve in Bonner Laws administration and then in Baldwin's. He, he began as postmaster general, 
and in 1923, for the first time, became Minister of Health. Um, and he rose very quickly in the Conservative Party ranks because so many Tories were refusing to serve. Those who had served in the coalition were refusing to serve under Bonner Law. And uh, he became Chancellor of the Exchequer briefly. And then when he got back into, uh, when Baldwin uh, got back into office after the first Labour government in late 1924, he became Minister of Health again. There are, there are aspects in Chamberlain's upbringing which I think affect his personality as a, as a minister. He had a very unconventional breeding for a politician, despite being son of one of the most famous statesmen of the 19th century, Joe Chamberlain, and half-brother of Austin Chamberlain, one of the most notable statesmen of the 20th century. Uh, Neville Chamberlain didn't go to university. He trained as an accountant. And with his brother Austin, he went out to the Bahamas in 1896, when he was just 26 years old, to see on Joe's behalf um, whether there was a plantation there that was suitable for growing sisal. Uh, there was a huge demand for sisal in the late 19th century. Um, it, was, it was used for rope, it was used for floor coverings, hats, shoes, and items of luggage. Um, and he and his brother Austin thought this was a great investment. They spent £50,000 of Joe Chamberlain's money on it. Joe, of course, was colonial secretary at the time in Salisbury's government and was unable to engage in business directly himself. Um, and that £50,000 was lost. Um, Neville was left in charge of the plantation uh, for reasons that were not entirely his fault, but uh, many of them are climatic and acts of God. Um, Sizel didn't grow very well. They couldn't sell it at the price they'd imagined. And the £50,000 of Joe's money that went down the drain was equivalent to about £5 million today. Now, although it wasn't entirely Neville Chamberlain's fault, it was also Austin's fault, um, he, Neville, took the blame. Uh, it depressed him, but it also motivated him enormously. Uh, it made him very obstinate. Uh, it gave what another historian has called his unassailable belief in his own rectitude. Uh, but it also made him incredibly determined. Uh, he was determined never to repeat the failure that he'd had with the uh, Sizel plantation. And when he got back to England uh, after the turn of the century, he used his accountancy expertise to get a position in an engineering firm in Birmingham. And he distinguished himself in this firm and in a succession of other firms as a very clever commercial strategist and as a very successful manager. And in the decade before the Great War, he went on to run several engineering businesses and improved the performance of every one. Uh, strikes were virtually unknown in his businesses. This was at a time when uh, there was enormous industrial unrest in most of the old industries um, in Britain, the, the period that Ramsay MacDonald called the Great Unrest before the Great War. And he was much loved by his employees because he was so progressive. He learned his progressive policy from Joe Chamberlain, who'd been, of course, the legendary Lord Mayor of Birmingham. Uh, and he provided health care and pension schemes for his workers to reward their hard work and their loyalty. He himself became Lord Mayor of Birmingham in 1915, after only four years on the City Council, and made a conspicuous success of it. It's why he was asked by Lloyd George to become um, uh, the man in charge of national service. Uh, and he had uh, what uh, Maurice Cowling famously called a common desire to prove that conservatives cared about the working classes. So that sense of, of uh, progressivism and his uh, stubbornness and obstinacy were the, were the qualities and the flaws that he brought into politics. He was perhaps also assisted by not, by not being a doctrinaire conservative. Um, indeed, and again, like his father, uh, who landed upon the Conservative wars, it then was Unionist Party by accident after the 1886 Home Rule crisis, Neville was not really a Conservative at all. Um, when he stood for Parliament, it was as a candidate for the Birmingham Unionist Association. And uh, he never made a secret of his desire to um, advance social progress. Um, he got a plenty of chance to do this in his appointment as Minister of Health. He showed a considerable ability, as I say, very quickly. In, in his five months of health, he started programmes in municipal reform and uh, reform and set about reforming national 
systems of welfare such as they were in those days. The Addison housing program, the Lloyd famous Lloyd George idea of homes fit for heroes, I misquote him, I know, but um, that's what it's become known as, uh, had uh, fallen to pieces in 1921. Addison had resigned. Lloyd George had never allowed enough money for this uh, program. And Neville Chamberlain set out to revise this, to revise house building. Uh, by bringing in a £6 subsidy per house per year over 20 years um, on houses that were for sale. His ideological flexibility helped him accept that the vast amount of housing that was needed in post-war Britain would not be forthcoming unless the state helped pay for it. It's a very unconservative view. Uh, however, at the same time, he refused um, uh, contemplating higher subsidies than £6 per house because he believed, I think quite rightly, that uh, more subsidies would drive prices back to absurd levels, which is what had undone the, the Lloyd George programme. The perception, however, that this benefited the rising lower middle class at the expense of blue-collar workers did harm conservative support among working-class people. And the building of their lower specification house, housing had already stopped uh, under Chamberlain's predecessors because rent controls made them uneconomical. It's also true the houses that were built under his act were very small. Um, it took an amendment to that act to expand them to more than 950 square feet, but they were more sanitary than those they replaced. And uh, the act also had a, an effect in stimulating public sector supply, um, though he claimed in 1925, uh, when he was health minister for the second time, that his act had already shown that it was building up a whole new class of good citizens. So we go back again to Joe Chamberlain's progressivism from Birmingham in the 1870s. By 1929, thanks to his initiative, a total of 436,000 houses had been built, although only uh, around uh, a fifth of those had been for local authority tenants. But perhaps the most significant um, uh, 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 advance of his um, was um, that uh, he or what he realized about himself was that having been Minister of Health briefly, he didn't want to take the job of Chancellor of the Exchequer when it was offered to him after Baldwin's victory in 1924. He was so devoted to this progressive um, uh, reform uh, agenda that he knew he couldn't do it as Chancellor of the Exchequer, it was Treasury. He wanted to go back to the Ministry of Health. That, uh, with various interesting consequences, led to Winston Churchill becoming Chancellor. Um, he told his sister Hilda, who was one of his two great confidants, the other was his sister Ida, he said, I could have been Chancellor, but told SB that whilst I was prepared to do what he wanted, I preferred my old job. Uh, and he realised that the Ministry of Health, although it was called that, was really a Ministry of Local Government, and it had tentacles that extended so far into national life that it gave him extraordinary power and influence. And within days of becoming Minister of Health again in 1924, he had devised a programme of legislation that would run through the entire parliament. And he said to Ida, his sister, unless we leave our mark as social reformers, the country will take it out of us hereafter. And by 1929, that ministry had sponsored 25 bills, 21 of which were enacted. Now, his zeal and energy elevated him above his colleagues. Uh, some of the things he did were the Widows, Orphans and Old Age Contributory Pensions Act of 1925. Um, he also uh, reformed the poor law. It's perhaps the most important thing he did. He wanted responsibility for supporting uh, the indigent removed from parishes um, and placed uh, on, uh, centrally on the government and on the treasury. If he hadn't done this, who knows what would have happened when unemployment reached three million in the 1930s. It was a very far-sighted measure, not only because it meant that um, unemployed people could be sustained with certainty by uh, the taxpayer rather than by the ratepayer, uh, but also uh, it meant the abolition of the local boards of guardians and the workhouse. It's astonishing how many people still think the workhouse went out with Charles Dickens. In fact, it was there until 1930, and it was Chamberlain who abolished it. Now, as one who considered himself a liberal unionist, just as his father had, Chamberlain had been impressed by William Beveridge's 1924 pamphlet, Insurance for All and Everything. Um, 
it, it described the need for a widow's as opposed to a war widow's pension with additions for dependent children and for the old age pension to start at 65, not 70. Uh, now, this is an, a, an era when I think the average lifespan for a woman was 57 and for a man was 52. So uh, it was um, for a pension to start at 70 was really uh, quite a comical idea. Um, Chamberlain wanted a comprehensive insurance scheme covering not just old age and the widow, but also unemployment and sick pay. And he outlined such a scheme for Baldwin when they were in opposition during the 1924 Labour government. And this really, Chamberlain's whole series of proposals along these lines um, give that 1924 government the most um, astonishing record of progress. And he is almost the only person in that government who actually achieves anything. Uh, he worries when he's Minister of Health about the diet of poor people, about whether the money paid to the unemployed is, is sufficient. Um, but it means by 1929, he has established himself not just as a formidable figure in the Conservative firmament, but also probably as Baldwin's heir apparent, uh, whenever that time uh, was to come. And also that uh, he is now a big power broker in the Conservative Party. And so when we get to 1931, after the, elect the 29 elections been lost by the Conservatives, uh, the Labour government has its uh, economic problems of um, that come after the Wall Street crash. By 1931, by August 1931, the country is already ba almost bankrupt. And it is, um, in, while Baldwin is on holiday in, uh, uh, in Aix-les-Bains, uh, it is Chamberlain who leads the Conservative Party's response to this and who is um, up front with King George V at getting a national government formed um, before Baldwin actually gets back to England, um, he's uh, guaranteed that Baldwin and he would serve in that national government uh, and that Ramsay MacDonald would lead it. Uh, and it's Chamberlain's decision, effectively, that Ramsay MacDonald should lead it because he says international confidence in our country depends on him. He has a high international reputation and uh, we need to support him. Um, Philip Snowden, who was... Macdonald's Chancellor in that government and the man who took us off the gold standard, um, uh, one of the most far-sighted and important economic acts of the decade, um, refused to fight the election. Uh, he'd fallen out with Macdonald by then. And so Chamberlain becomes Chancellor of the Exchequer in Macdonald's national government in November 1931. And he is a man who, again, excels in a crisis. And there is an enormous crisis uh, financial crisis obviously running right through until effectively 1934. Um, he manages in 1932 to start reducing the national debt, to maintain a balanced budget, uh, and to get a large part of Britain's war loan converted to lower interest bearing bonds, which drives down the cost of supporting the national debt. Um, we are repaying debt at a huge rate from the late, uh, from the mid 20s until. Uh, Chamberlain becomes Chancellor, we're repaying uh, at a rate that means at least 40% of public spending is devoted annually to servicing debt, which is an unimaginable figure by today's standards. Um, in a further attempt to uh, improve morale, Chamberlain <laughs> convinces the Cabinet that the unemployment figures, which have been published weekly up until then, uh, should, from January 1932, appear monthly. So as well as having a practical, almost Gladstonian approach to politics. Chamberlain uh, also understands the importance of maintaining public morale at a time when all around Europe there's tremendous political instability. Chamberlain's ability, I think, would have distinguished him in a government of statesmen and in a government of has-beens and mediocrities. He, he shone very brightly. He took risks and he broke with orthodoxies. Um, he had massive integrity. He had a commanding sense of decency. Uh, but on the other hand, he wasn't popular. He wasn't clubbable. He didn't suffer fools. His biggest mistake was probably treating the Labour Party as something akin to pond life. Um, his bark was as bad as his bite, um, uh, Lord Vansett had said of him. Uh, and he thought he annoyed, and Vansett thought that Chamberlain annoyed people because he seldom slipped. He had command of himself and exercised it sharply. He was under no illusions by the time he became Chancellor that he could dominate the cabinet. And uh, he did... 
and it bred a self-regard that would harm him when he became prime minister. Uh, and indeed, the, 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 the traits that he had developed by this stage were what went against him in May 1940. He had very strained relations with Ramsay MacDonald, whom he thought, frankly, uh, not e not his equal either intellectually or uh, or managerially. And um, as the 1931 Parliament wore on and he presented more and more budgets, the economy improved and his reputation greatly improved with it. He was on the case of public housing schemes and public work schemes and greater public spending when it could be afforded, even before Keynes wrote the general theory. Um, and indeed, he consulted Keynes, and, and Keynes was a very serious influence on him as, as Chancellor. Um, the, uh, the public sector indeed grew slowly throughout the slump uh, under Chamberlain's leadership from 5% of the workforce in 1929 to nearly 6% in 1938. Um, Chamberlain was able by 1934 to report a £39 million surplus on the budget. Um, he, there was a £29 million surplus the following year. And he said in 1935 that, broadly speaking, we have recovered in this country 80% of our prosperity. Um, by that stage, since 1929, production had increased by 10%. And although wages had fallen by 3%, the cost of living had dropped by 13%. So people were, even people on the dole, with the, the cut that was made in the dole in 1931, were slightly better off than they had been in the depths of the slump. He also borrowed money to support some strategic industries, notably shipbuilding. Um, and uh, he uh, later on um, borrowed money to build up armaments. And this takes us on to the question of appeasement. Um, Churchill, in speaking in May 1932 in the House of Commons, um, said that uh, he would put his trust in, and I quote, the patient and skillful removal of the causes of antagonism, which a wise foreign policy should eventually achieve. In doing so, he summed up really what became Chamberlain's foreign policy when he became prime minister in 1937. He wanted patiently and skillfully to remove political causes of antagonism. The trouble was he was dealing with a maniac <clears throat> in, the, in the shape of Adolf Hitler. I just want to say something about what appeasement really means, given the ubiquity of the word in our discussions of 1930s politics, and particularly about Chamberlain. Um, it's important to note how what it meant at the time in the early 30s differs from what it's come to mean. Uh, as with the word Holocaust, the events of the Second World War and their place in historical memory has changed the meaning of what that word had indicated since the Middle Ages. The OED published coincidentally in 1933, after more, half, more than half a century of labour, gave it um, as the first definition of the verb appease, to bring peace, to pacify, quiet or settle strife or disorder. Uh, it comes from the Latin ad pacere and through the medieval French ad pese. Um, both of which had a meaning identical to that given by the 1933 dictionary. But um, it, uh, it, it says in, in, the, in the OED in 1933 that, it, that appeasement means the action or process of appeasing, notably to achieve pacification and satisfaction. Nowhere does it suggest then, and this is when the word is being used quite promiscuously in political discourse, that the act should entail uh, surrender uh, capitulation or humiliation by or of the appeaser. Um, and indeed, it could be argued that the most significant act of appeasement in living memory was the armistice, which had pacified Europe after four years of slaughter and had been dictated by the victorious powers. But the events of 1933-39 have retrospectively brought such a smell to appeasement. Um, the latest edition of the OED records a new interpretation of the word, which it dates from an entry in the Annual Register of 1939, and which concisely contrasts the change in meaning the public opinion had by the eve of war imposed upon the verb to appease. It says, so far from were they from trying to appease the dictators that they might be described as facing up to them. Thus, to appease had come to mean the opposite of to face up. The new definition has it that in the political context it was used in a derogatory sense especially of the British Prime Minister's efforts 
from 1937 to placate and so stave off the threatened aggression of the Axis powers. So appeasement has become a dirty word. And indeed, from 1938, never mind 1939, it is being <clears> used <throat> in that very pejorative sense. Now, Chamberlain is under no illusions about Hitler. He is painted as someone who's so naive, he doesn't get it at all. Um, he he writes to one of his sisters on the 3rd of September 1938, so 11 days before he makes his first visit to Germany. Is it not positively horrible to think that the fate of hundreds of millions depends on this man and that he is half mad? And he is so convinced of the madness of Hitler, I mean, not least to, due to his half-brother, Sir Austin, who is very quick off the mark in 1933, about how bad Hitler is, that uh, Chamberlain, as Chancellor, starts to do what he can to get uh, rearmament going. Um, he says on the 6th of June 1934, as Chancellor, that Britain could not afford to fight both Japan and Germany. Japan, of course, has invaded Manchuria two and a half years earlier. Chamberlain's sentiments upset uh, Sir Maurice Hankey, who chaired the Defence Requirements Subcommittee and was Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Chamberlain sat on this, and precisely because he was Chancellor, exerted great influence. Um, he uh, he, he uh, was mocked by uh, Chatfield, the first sea lord, um, because the, the Navy had a fixation with combat against Japan. However, Chamberlain said, we cannot provide simultaneously for hostilities with Japan and Germany, and the latter is the problem to which we must address ourselves. A defence requirement subcommittee was set up in 1933 upon which Chamberlain sat and it was believed by the subcommittee generally that to do things on a German scale would require a mere additional 25 squadrons for the RAF. Chamberlain, however, in 1933 wanted 80 squadrons for the Metropolitan RAF, which he said he would fund by halving the subcommittee's recommendations for the other two services. Um, in fact, he immediately found more money, uh, although the Navy the Navy was um, boosted, as I'll illustrate in a moment, but the Army had to wait until Chamberlain's uh, Prime Ministership. He writes in 1935 that we must hurry our own rearmament, that's the phrase he uses, because of what he sees going on in Germany. Um, he's so pro-rearmament in 1935 that at the 1935 election, when Stanley Baldwin, his leader and by then Prime Minister, makes a commitment that there will be no great armaments, that's the exact phrase he uses, um, Chamberlain says quite the reverse, and he's accused by Arthur Greenwood, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, of scaremongering. Um, it's at that time, in late 1935, uh, that um, there is a development going of the new monoplane that would involve into the Hawker Hurricane, uh, designed by Sidney Cam, who was Hawker's chief engineer. There's, they approach the air ministry for money and it falls flat. However, um, when Chamberlain gets to hear of this uh, late in 1934, uh, he decides to reallocate funding and he, the taxpayer pays for an improved design to the Hurricane. It would first fly on the 6th of November 1935 uh, from Brooklands, the motor racing circuit in Surrey, and also by the end of 1934, something resembling the Spitfire with its famous ell elliptical wings is on the drawing board at the Southampton office of R.J. Mitchell, the chief designer at Supermarine. He also, Chamberlain, funds the building of airfields and the RAF, because he's convinced that air superiority is going to win the next war, uh, he is. Uh, he, he begins to fund the RAF in in far greater terms. Its manpower rises from thirty two thousand in nineteen thirty five to fifty six thousand in nineteen thirty seven. It was had a defence budget of sixteen point seven million in nineteen thirty three. By nineteen thirty eight, before Munich, it's one hundred and forty three million more than the other two services combined. He becomes Prime Minister in 1937, and of course then has more or less complete power um, over how we proceed. This has a very bad effect in that he decides to become his own Foreign Secretary. Uh, and that of course forces Eden out in the spring of 1938, which unbalances the government. Eden resigns, as I'm sure you all know, 
um, over his famous determination to try and cozy up to Mussolini and to put uh, some sort of division between Mussolini and Hitler. Um, Chamberlain uh, couldn't have known that by the time he succeeded Baldwin in May 1937, he, as Chancellor, would have raised the estimate for the following five years to defence spending, so up until 1942, to an extra one and a half billion pounds. Um, now, that was a figure that most Conservative MPs had dreamed of a year or two earlier. Chamberlain said on 21st September 1935, before the election campaign of that year, that only if Britain were recognised to be strong enough could she fulfil her mission of the peacemaker of Europe. Um, he confides in his sisters, and I must say to anybody who's really interested in Chamberlain, that the archive of letters to his two sisters is the most valuable gold mine you're, you're ever going to find, where he, he says that um, he really has to keep increasing defence estimates. He really has to keep funding rearmament, whether Baldwin likes it or not. And there are great tensions in the months before he takes over from Baldwin um, about how much more defence spending uh, is is going up. Um, he eventually, by 1938, has promised to increase the uh, RAF to 124 squadrons uh, with 1,736 aircraft in it. Um, in the, his 1936 budget, he says that um, uh, expenditure on the armed forces uh, is going to go up by about another 30% that year. It was thought, by the way, that in 1936 that would bring our defence spending up to around um, a fifth of what Germany was spending. In fact, the Germans, of course, were lying about what they were spending. It was going to be near a half. Um, the naval budget also increased. Uh, in 1936 alone, for example, Chamberlain authorised the expenditure on two new capital ships, five cruisers, nine destroyers, four submarines, one aircraft carrier, six sloops, and a range of small craft, including two motor minesweepers, six motor torpedo boats, and one river gunboat. So by the time he becomes Prime Minister, uh, the age of disarmament is really over. And the following year, the naval, in 1937, the naval uh, programme is even bigger. Uh, it's more or less the same as 1936, but it's got 36 miscellaneous vessels, seven submarines, and 10 motor, to motor torpedo boats. Now, it's not least because he was such a good chancellor that Chamberlain had created an economic climate that had eased um, the ability to pay for uh, all these extra armaments. And um, in March 1938, when he's been prime minister for nine months and a month after Eden's resignation, he's absolutely frank with his fellow members of parliament that um, Britain may have to embark upon a war and needs to be ready to do so. Um, but he's had a report from the Chiefs of Staff, and this is something which I think profoundly affects what he does at Munich and on his other two visits to Germany in September 1938. And I think what he learns from his Chiefs of Staff is not taken into account. They say to him, we conclude that no pressure that we and our possible allies can bring to bear, either by land or sea or in the air, could prevent Germany from invading and overrun Bohemia and from inflicting a decisive defeat on the Czechoslovakian army. We should then be faced with the necessity of undertaking a war against Germany for the purpose of restoring Czechoslovakia's lost integrity. And this object would only be achieved by the defeat of Germany and as the outcome of a prolonged struggle. In the world situation today, this is March 1938, it seems to us that if such a struggle were to take place, it is more than probable that both Italy and Japan would seize the opportunity to further their own ends. And that, in consequence, the problem we have to envisage is not that of a limited European war only, but of a world war. Uh, a couple of days earlier, the specific advice that he has been given by the Chiefs of Staff is that after the fall of the Czech, of Czechoslovakia, the French would remain behind the Maginot lines. The Germans, owing to the strength of their air force, could damage us more than we could damage them. At least two months would elapse before the United Kingdom could give any effective help to France. Meanwhile, the people of this country would have been put in a position of being subjected to constant bombing 
a responsibility that no government ought to take. He tells his sister a week before he goes to Munich, he's been reading Tempoli's study of Canning's foreign policy. He says, the key lesson I've learned is that you should never menace unless you're in a position to carry out your threats. And although if we were to fight, I should hope we should be able to give a good account of ourselves, we are certainly not in a position in which the military advisers would feel happy in undertaking to begin hostilities if we were not forced to do so. He also consults Dominion Prime Ministers who've got autonomy following the Statute of Westminster. This is not like 1914 where a declaration of war by the mother country brings in you know, what we would now call the white commonwealth to support us. He says that there was no enthusiasm to join a fight over Czechoslovakia. Admiral Sinclair, the head of the Secret Intelligence Service, tells him on the 14th of September that nothing could be done to prevent Germany being reunited with the Sudetenland. Uh, but he also advises Chamberlain, Vice Chamberlain takes, to continue to arm heavily. He says, our own policy must rest on the capacity to retaliate with adequate force. Our only chance of preserving peace is to be ready for war on any scale without relying too much on outside support. Now, Chamberlain took that advice. He knew we were not ready for war on any scale in September 1938, which is why, sadly, he, you know, with support from the French, said he could do nothing to prevent the Sudetenland being, uh, being taken by the Nazis. Also, um, Belisha, his war minister, a much under, underrated man, uh, rather like Chamberlain himself, uh, has spoke, has, Belisha is Jewish and he has been reading out at selected cabinet meetings extracts from Mein Kampf, just in case any of his fellow ministers are unaware of some of the things that Hitler is planning. And he speaks in the margins of a cabinet meeting on the 14th of September about the horrors of war, of German bombers over London, and his horror in allowing our people to suffer all the miseries of war in our present state. But Belisha is also told by the uh, chief of um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Imperial General Staff that day that to take offensive against Germany now would be like a man attacking a tiger before he's loaded his gun. I'm almost out of time, but I just want to say that in the light of everything that Chamberlain was told um, and that Belisha was told uh, during the run-up to Munich, I'm not sure what else a responsible prime minister could have done. He had very limited resources. Um, he had inherited a policy from not just from Stanley Baldwin and Ramsay MacDonald of uh, trying to run down our armed forces and succeeding. But also it mustn't be forgotten that in the five years that Churchill was Chancellor of the Exchequer in the 1920s, he cut defence spending in each of his five budgets. Um, so that's something that Churchill doesn't uh, admit, oddly enough, in the gathering storm. I'll leave it to you to, to wonder why. Um, Churchill was, um, of course, the man who wrote the, the, the most influential history of this period in the immediate post-war um, period and no one was there really apart from Keith failing to to do it for Chamberlain and Chamberlain today 80 years more or less after the war is finished I think has still not had a fair crack of the whip um, I just want to conclude by reading one contemporary account of Chamberlain it's written by of all people A.P. Herbert who um, was uh famed as a comic writer but was, was an independent member of parliament and Herbert said in his memoirs in 1950 that he'd adored Churchill and didn't like Chamberlain but I admired him he added I hated the dictators as much as Mr Churchill did and often said so in the press but I wanted Mr Chamberlain to be right and keep the peace successfully I would never throw a stone at him then and I will not now when we are all so much wiser. He reminded his readers of the Labour Party's hypocrisy in claiming to oppose dictators while voting almost every year uh, against the defence estimates and indeed of opposing conscription in 1939. Uh, and he recalled the events of 28th of September 38 when Chamberlain had theatrically announced to the Commons that he'd fly to Munich for one last attempt to reason with Hitler. And Herbert wrote, I stood up in the end and cheered as nearly all members did that melodramatic afternoon. Any man who stood and cheered that day to think a long time, it seemed to me, 
before he cast a stone. I don't know how easy it will be to rehabilitate Neville Chamberlain, but I think that all the facts, as opposed to the prejudice, uh, of what went on, particularly in those last weeks before Munich, mean that he merits ample reconsideration at this stage. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Simon, for that uh, compelling uh, reassessment uh, of Neville Chamberlain, uh, which I'm sure uh, will be uh, of great influence uh, when people come to see this uh, webinar uh, and consider your argument, because the evidence that you've adduced is compelling. And I suppose my first question, although I want to come back to, to Neville Chamberlain as Minister of Health and so forth, is to ask you know, whether, as it were, in 1940, with the publication of Guilty Men written by Michael Foote and so forth, we see something very common in society, uh, the use of hindsight after the event uh, and the desire for scapegoats and the desire to blame, um, when in fact all the evidence points to, you know, great concern and serious statesmanship based upon the best evidence that was then available in the autumn of 1938. I think you're absolutely right. And Guilty Men is, in many regards, an absolutely shameful um, uh, publication. Uh, mm. It pretends to be something it isn't. It pretends to be um, a, a description of the uh, omniscience of Chamberlain's political opponents mm. uh, uh, and how right they were and how wrong he was. As I said a moment ago, um, the Labour Party in Parliament routinely voted down the defence estimates and it wouldn't even approve a limited amount of conscription uh, after the uh, invasion of Czechoslovakia in March 1939 even though we had given a guarantee to Poland which was obviously next on the shopping list for Hitler um, that we would have at that stage to declare war. It's really the first draft of um, a radical manifesto for the 1945 election mm -hmm. uh, guilty and um, it's it's untruthful. Uh, of course, it makes some uh, some some relatively accurate points about the lack of preparedness for war. But this was a lack of preparedness that the Labour Party itself was at the forefront of ensuring came about. There was a massive pacifist movement in this country in the 1930s. After the Fulham by-election in 1933, when a Labour candidate who supported disarmament uh, was elected, um, Baldwin, I think quite wrongly, was terrified uh, into rowing back on any promises that he might have appeared to make um, about uh, building up our armed forces and having something other than collective security under the League of Nations as a way of protecting uh, the national, indeed the imperial, interest. And... It is, um, I mean, Churchill quite correctly condemned Chamberlain, uh, not Chamberlain, Baldwin. Baldwin admitted this in the House of Commons in early 1936. He said, well, you know, I was terrified to talk about rearming because I thought that would be the end of the Conservative Party. And Churchill says to him, well, how appalling of you to put a sectarian party interest ahead of what's good for the country. And um, Bal Baldwin is... Uh, I think, a, a really quite compromised figure. And the attacks in Guilty Men and the attacks in 1940, yes, they're made with hindsight, but they don't necessarily all apply, or many of them don't apply at all, to the Chamberlain administration from 1937 onwards. They apply to what Ramsay MacDonald, of course, considered a traitor by the Labour Party, and Baldwin himself, as Ramsay MacDonald's right-hand man and as Prime Minister from 35 to 37, had allowed to happen to the armed forces. Although, to be fair to um, MacDonald, it is in 1932 under his premiership that the so-called 10-year rule, which is where government departments are told to imagine there won't be another war within 10 years, is lifted. So in 1932, it's even before Hitler comes to power, things are looking dodgy enough, and it's largely because of the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Things are looking dodgy enough in the world that... Um, uh, the government says, well, we, we, there might be a war within 10 years. We better start preparing for it. But the, that's a rhetorical statement. The actual preparation is pretty minimal. Mm. 
I wonder also, when thinking about you know, the breadth of British history over some centuries, whether the expectation that somehow in the 1930s, Chamberlain should have rearmed to such a degree that we were capable of somehow preventing Hitler uh, occupying the Sudetenland and then the rest of Czechoslovakia. Uh, that is almost pie in the sky because traditionally we've never had large land armies and we've very rarely been able to, to, to put them on the continent and we've paid for others or formed alliances to, as it were, stop a particular power are controlling the continent. I mean, there is an ahistorical kind of side to the way in which Chamberlain has been criticised. Yes, there is. And again, the only person in the Labour Party who actually showed any realism and indeed genuine patriotism about this was Eddie Bevin. And of course, he wasn't even in Parliament. He was a trade union leader. But uh, he was a deeply patriotic and highly intelligent man who realised exactly what was happening in Europe and how you know, whatever means we use to counter it, a big land army you know, marching to Prague to liberate it was was simply never going to be part of it. It's it's on a level of madness. Uh, mm. There was Churchill's pl uh, uh, idea in the winter of 1915 that uh, we could have a naval invasion of, of Germany uh, from the Baltic, you know, sort of landing at Kiel and marching to Berlin from there. These things are simply not realistic. Uh, all we could do, and I, Chamberlain, I know, realised this very early on, was when we had the resources and as things got more and more dangerous, to build up our armaments so that we could send a, a force, as we had in 1914, to mainland Europe, to France or Belgium, mm -hmm. and take on the Germans on a Western front mm -hmm. uh, and beat Germany and then with luck be able to go, uh, Germany having been beaten, and liberate uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Czech lands that had been invaded, or by this stage, the, the Polish lands that had been invaded. Uh, and of course, a version of that happened, but with the Soviet Union involved as well. And yes, it is pie in the sky, and there is a, just a little bit too much hindsight mm. that goes on. There's a lot that we did know in the 1930s. I mean, we were well aware even before Kristallnacht, of Hitler's persecution of the Jews. We were well aware of that and of the iniquities of that. We were well aware of his persecution of uh, people who didn't agree with him uh, 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 politically. Even we knew about his persecution of homosexuals. Mm -hmm. um, so anyone who thought uh, until 1938 that Hitler was a nice guy was clearly mad. Um, but... Uh, that isn't the same as having the ability suddenly to put in place a war machine that will make Hitler think twice about either continuing that sort of bad behaviour or engaging in random acts of conquest uh, around Germany. Uh, I think if you look at the figures, and given we had just come out of a terrible slump, and were largely on our own, I mean, the Americans were entirely isolationist, there was no sense until really weeks before Pearl Harbor, that Roosevelt might consider coming out of an isolationist stance and re you know, repeating the help of 1917-18. Um, we rearmed as fast as we could without bankrupting ourselves. Um, and we also rearmed in step with the change of attitudes on behalf of the British people there was still, in 1935-36, an awful lot of people who never wanted another war of any description. And those who'd lived through 1914-18, you can entirely understand their point of view. It's a perfectly respectable point of view. It was only as the wickedness of Hitler became more and more apparent, which wasn't really until the Anschluss uh, in, in uh, the spring of 1938, that we re that more and more people in this country realise that they might well have to fight, or at least endorse a government that was going to fight uh, for liberty and uh, on the continent of Europe. Mm -hmm. and Chamberlain, I think, made every feasible preparation he could as quickly as he could for that. Mm -hmm. But beyond preparation, I wonder if the case against Chamberlain is the sort of moral case about compromising over Czech sovereignty. Now, we see it 
quite interestingly in the Ukraine crisis at present that we say we will support Ukraine and Ukrainian sovereignty uh, it is their decision ultimately, uh, and we will support their decision. And of course, that's not quite what Chamberlain did at Munich. He compromised over Czech sovereignty. Uh, and I wonder if there was an alternative to that, whether simply walking away from the table at that point and saying, we cannot, we're not prepared to, to compromise over the fate of democratic Czechoslovakia, um, uh, and we can't come to an agreement whether that might have been an alternative way and whether the moral objection is the stronger to the, the prudential objection over defence uh, uh, deployments and so forth. I think the difference between the two situations of now and then is we know just how very badly stretched Putin's forces are and we know we can say to the Ukrainians, quite rightly in my view, we are supportive of your sovereignty and we would defend your sovereignty. Because we know that there probably are not going to have to be a, a single British pair of boots going on the ground uh, in Ukraine to fight against the Russians. Because once that happens, we're on the verge of a third world war. Mm. And I think we know that and the Russians know that. That wasn't the case in 1938. If we had walked away, that would have been an open invitation to Hitler just to walk in to the whole of the Czech lands, as he did the following March, to create his puppet state in Slovakia, as he did the following March, um, and to say, OK, what are you going to do about it? Mm. And that I think, would have been an even greater humiliation. And the humiliation came, and it was, as you know, within 10 days, followed by the guarantee to Poland. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. The guarantee to Poland held Hitler off for five months. Mm. Mm. Uh, because, again, although we rearmed at a tremendous rate in the summer of 1939. He knew he could do that, particularly after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. He could do that, and there was virtually nothing we could do about it, short of defeat him in the West. It always comes back to that. We always have to defeat Hitler in the West, and eventually the Soviet Union changes its mind and fights him from the East. Um, and it's not until that happens that we can do anything about Poland. So we we honour our promise about Poland, uh, but it takes a very long time to deliver on it. Yes. Well, if I can take you back to the first part of your in fascinating discussion uh, about Chamberlain, uh, let me put to you this point that the way you describe him, and, you know, it's absolutely the case that he was a very fine administrator, a man with a social conscience, a man who, you know, in a sense, sense shaped modern conservatism or took forward that Disraelian inheritance uh, and developed that that social policy for conservatism. But would it be in, entirely stupid if I said that perhaps he was always a liberal unionist rather than a traditional conservative? I mean, his, his father had been... Uh, and joins a cabinet, a conservative cabinet, but was, of course, uh, a, 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 a liberal by origin in his politics. And there's a sense in which that Chamberlainite tradition of liberal unionism seems to inform Neville as you present him in the 20s and 30s. Lawrence, you're absolutely right. And indeed, uh, Chamberlain told a joke at his own expense uh, at the great party meeting on, I think, the 3rd of June, 1937 where he was confirmed as leader. And he said, it's very good of the Conservative Party to make me its leader, when I'm not actually a Conservative. He was a Liberal Unionist. Hmm. And he, he's the first to admit it. And he's, you know, I mean, Joe was very cynical, as indeed Churchill was, in that um, if they fell out with their own party, they might not have a lot in common with the opposite party, but there was enough in common that they could turn up and uh, uh, and join that party. And that's exactly what Neville Chamberlain did. And of course, you're right to say that his desire to improve the lot of working class people, uh, which he had started to do in Birmingham during the war as Lord Mayor in very difficult circumstances, and which his father had done uh, consistently throughout the 1870s, um, was part of a liberal tradition. I think it's also why he was so uh, contemptuous of the Labour Party. Because I think he thought the Labour Party were just Johnny come lately on this front. Um, most genuine conservatives of his generation, and indeed later, had some respect for the Labour Party. They saw them as people who, you know, many of them had, you know, left school at the age of twelve and worked in really quite grim manual occupations, gone down coal mines, uh, 
um, and spoke with real authority about the plight of working class people and what conditions were like. Um, Chamberlain never had that respect for them. And of course, it's why um, they refused to come into government with him in September 1939. They had to wait until Churchill became uh, prime minister and he and Attlee got on perfectly well. But um, you know, Attlee was somebody with whom Chamberlain did not even have you know, decent, decent relations that normally go between a, a prime minister and a leader of the opposition. It was almost uh, uh, you know, at the sort of level that you got when Theresa May was leading the Conservative Party and Jeremy Corbyn was was leading Labour. Um, you know, she could barely bring herself to speak to him. And I think that's rather how um, uh, Chamberlain felt about Attlee, even though Attlee was a far superior character. Yeah. Um, so, so, yes, there is that liberal tradition. Mm-hmm. And it, it informed you know, it, those 25 bills, 21 of which were enacted, that he that he takes through the House of Commons uh, as Minister of Health in the 1920s, that's a liberal agenda. And it's it it does quite a lot to ensure that the Liberal Party do not come back um, <laughs> after the 1929 election, because mm. a lot of what they would have done has just been done. Well, your point reminds me of, of the argument of Robert Skidelsky many years ago in that book, Politicians and the Slump, that with Labour in power in 1931, based upon a kind of utopian uh, tradition, uh, it was simply in, in no position to deal with the minutiae of a financial and economic crisis, whereas someone like Chamberlain was. I mean, he was he was uh, commanding, as you present him at the Treasury, uh, as, you know, somebody able to cope with the problems of massive debt and indeed uh, social reconstruction. Uh, and so your point about his contempt for a, a party that had come late to uh, social reform and hadn't thought through the, the, the minutiae, the dynamics of social reform, makes some sense in view of Skidelsky's argument, I think. Oh, I agree. And, um, you know, Chamberlain was a trained accountant and he had run a business. He could read a balance sheet. I mean, he understood money. He understood capitalism, which is not the same thing as understanding an economy. But in our um, uh, settlement, uh, it's quite an important thing. I mean, I, I don't want to do down Philip Snowden, who was uh, McDonald's chancellor both in 1924 and in the 29 to 31 government, because Snowden absolutely understood that everyone would expect the Labour Party to be um, financially incompetent. And he took enormous steps as Chancellor of the Exchequer on those two occasions to show that they were entirely responsible. He he is the most Gladstonian Chancellor since Gladstone, without doubt, much more so than Harcourt or Asquith certainly much more than Lloyd George. He is a very Gladstonian Chancellor. And, you know, he also has the, 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 the brilliance to see the logic of taking us off the gold standard, which, you know, without which, who knows what would have happened to our economy in the 1930s. Um, so I don't want to do him down, but Chamberlain did have a natural aptitude for looking after the economic arrangements of this country. And as you say, he could see the minutiae. He didn't get lost um, in the way that the Labour Party did. The Labour Party was, of course, dealing with a storm that had blown into the other side of the Atlantic and was something that no one there had predicted. And it would have been interesting to see how a Conservative Chancellor, whether it was Churchill or Chamberlain, had they still been in office in October 1929, would have dealt with the mm. Wall Street mm. crash. Um, but certainly picking up the pieces two years later and having acclimatised himself to... You know, the fact that we started from there, Chamberlain did extremely well. Well, Simon, our, our time is out. The hour is up. Uh, but that was a, a, a wonderful presentation, if I may say so, of a man who perhaps 
definitely deserves uh, a new view to be rehabilitated. Uh, and you've made a compelling case. Uh, and I think all who watch this will go away uh, with a new view, not only on Chamberlain, but also on the 1920s and 30s. Uh, we were perhaps not as ill prepared as guilty men and others suggested uh, in 1940. Uh, uh, and Chamberlain deserves much credit uh, for that. So thank you again, uh, Simon. Um, and we look forward, we hope very much that your new book will sell well. Uh, and many congratulations on its publication. Thank you. Lawrence, thank you. Thank you for all that. And thank you again for inviting me. Thank you.